All right, so this morning we're going to talk about the impact of violence in the workplace. We're going to review state policy and definitions of what constitutes workplace violence. We're going to debunk myths about workplace violence, and there's actually quite a few of them. We're going to talk about warning signs of workplace violence. So if I could, um, if I could slant myself in one piece of this puzzle, I would want to push toward prevention, right? You'd rather not have to intervene if you don't have to. So I'm going to be talking about warning signs. You know, once you kind of identify folks who are workplace violence perpetrators, or could be, then there's definitely things that you can do to, um, to not engage that, to help bring the, um, the level of anger and hostility down. We're going to talk about the cycle of violence. The cycle of violence is going to help us predict when these things are building and about ready to happen. We're going to talk about intervention techniques with at-risk employees. When we figure out, when we identify who these are, we'll talk about how we can kind of intervene and, like I said, diffuse situations. Security steps and how to document should an event actually happen. All right, so these are some recent headlines. This was about five years ago. This is a, a shooting rampage that happened in Montgomery County, North Carolina. And this was at a lumber yard. And at this particular lumber yard, there were um, a group of men that spoke only Spanish, did not speak English. And there was a, uh, a co-worker of theirs, a man who did not speak Spanish. And he said that the, um, he said that those other men were making fun of us, laughing at us. The Hispanic men said, no, we're not laughing at them. We're laughing, but we're talking among ourselves. He insisted that they were looking at him, that, um, that they were laughing. So the supervisor goes to the to men and says, if you're laughing at them, stop it. And they said, we're not laughing. Truly, we're not laughing at them. We're just enjoying ourselves here. So this went on for weeks. And finally, the man who felt like he was being laughed at brought a gun to work and just started shooting a lot of his co-workers there in that particular group. Um, unless we think that all of these are women, I mean men, here's a great case of a woman doing this. This was the University of Alabama. Uh, a professor who was applying for tenure and she had been denied tenure. So she had appealed that decision and then was denied again. And so she was in her final um, appeal and in the final appeal, they were meeting up in this boardroom. It was like a second or third floor of a building down there. And what happened was is she was denied for the last time. And when she was denied for the last time, what they didn't know is that she came packing that day. She shot and killed three of her coworkers. And she's in prison today, actually. Um, this happened in my own backyard. This was at the Target in Apex. Any of y'all know where this is? It's on 55 and Highway 1, right there in Apex. There's a great big shopping center in that area. Target is there. And um, when I lived on that side of town, I remember um, uh, going up to Target. It was on my list of things to do that day. And when I drove up onto Target, there was already crime scene tape up. I mean, my thought was that, shoot, I'm going to have to go to Walmart now, right? <laughs> But what I didn't know is that a very good friend of mine was inside of this floor when this happened. And so she tells kind of a whole different view of, of you know, what we see in the media, what we see as somebody on the inside of this situation. But what happened was is that there was um, a woman who had a real violent relationship with a man. They lived in California. She left and came here. And uh, she ended up getting a job at the Apex um, Target store. What she didn't know is that he followed her by about two weeks. And according to the Apex police, he was uh, living in his car. And um, that particular Saturday morning, he had found her. And when he found her, he went into Target. He jumped up on top of that carousel, you know, where they bag your groceries and, you know, roll that thing around. He jumped up on top of that, gunned her down in cold blood, then turned and killed himself. 
Now, what my friend told me, who was actually in there, and of course she can't go back to Target to this day because of what she experienced in that store. Um, she said that it seems like the five minutes that it takes the police to get there seems like 30 minutes. She said, all of a sudden, there's an instant mix of the smell of blood and gunpowder. She said, people were screaming. All over the store, you can hear beep, 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 beep. Everybody's trying to dial 911 at the same time on their cell phones. People are trying to rush to get out the front door. It was really traumatic, and she made it out, but she, to this day, still can't go back to Target. And so we see these headlines come and go, but there are people that are impacted for the rest of their lives based on what happens here. So just to kind of let you know, it's these, these situations just impact not only that store at that per period of time, and most of us have even forgot this headline was existing, but for the people involved, it's still, it will be there for the rest of their lives. Um, this was up in New Jersey. This was last year. Uh, they called it the domestic situation led to, uh, led to a workplace shooting. These were two brother-in-laws who were fighting over a woman. Lord have mercy. These two brother-in-laws were fighting over a woman. One just hauls off and shoots the other one right at work. They call it a domestic situation. Um, remember James Holmes? This is our Aurora, Colorado shooter. Remember that? The Colorado uh, Aurora. Do this if you remember. Okay. So he... Um, Right, he went in, that Batman movie, went in and um, <coughs> shot and killed. So there's a couple of things about him that we'll talk about. Number one, he was probably one of these few perpetrators that have an active psychiatric diagnosis. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, we're talking about a lot about mental health in the media today about this. And also, there was a way in which he shot the victims that is very common among perpetrators. There was a pattern to this. They only talked about it one night on the news. And when I saw it, I thought, like clockwork. Like clockwork, just like the rest of them. So I will share that with you too. Um, and of course, here's our San Bernardino. This is still making um, headlines. The, the great big feud between Apple and the FBI right now over getting that data from those uh, cell phones. We still don't know, you know, a whole lot about this. Um, the only thing that I know, and I've been trying to dig and dig and read and try to find about the perpetrators, but all that I know is that on that particular night, it did not appear that that was his plan to set out that night. He had gone with his coworkers. Something set him off at that event, and we still don't know what that was. It would be interesting to find out what it was that set him off. For whatever reason, he got mad. He left, came back with his wife. Now, they had planned something because their whole garage was stockpiled full, right, of weapons, pipe bombs. So you know that there was a plan in place, but they're thinking that um, this kind of exacerbated that plan. We still know much more than that at this point. So uh, kind of to be determined as far as more about him. Um, oh, Steve Rossi. So um, I'll, I'll give you just a quick headline about him, and then we'll finish with him uh, before we go to lunch. Steve Rossi was a facilities management kind of director at the school district of Schenectady, New York. And he is someone who uh, started out as a workplace bully, and slowly over the course of about 10 years became a felon toward his employees. So it's really interesting to watch that progression and how this happened and how he got away with this stuff for so many years. Um, his story is really fascinating, but um, he's in prison today. All right, quick video just to give us a uh, background. And there's a few things I'll touch base on with this video as we go. Your emergency. There's a guy over here at McMillan Botts. 
He just walked in with a gun and he's threatening some people. I, I think he works in the warehouse and oh, he, he started to shoot. Please help. Please. He just started shooting people. Oh my God. Please send somebody right away. The shooter in an apparent murder-suicide at the Johnson Space Center had received a poor job review and feared being fired, according to police reports. Cam and the hostage negotiators established contact with the gunman. It just, it sounded like a firecracker. It was like pop, 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 and then everyone just started screaming and running. It appears that a missed bonus was a catalyst for a gunman's rampage. I was sitting right there, and he just... Started firing. There were no specific threats made from Mr. Hardy to his direct manager or any of the other victims in the shootings. God, why would somebody do this? Now, members of the SWAT team have arrived here between 8.30 and 9 a.m. and hostage negotiators have established contact with the gunman. Uh, we have the gunman in custody, and we have recovered a total of uh, 12 semi-automatic weapons, along with three pistols, which we believe were used in the attacks. Uh, it uh, was, uh, it was kind of a shock, you know. Uh, he was, he was just a, he was a quiet person, a very quiet person. Misuse of 
authority. Next is to get the employee a BOA in such a way that it violates this policy. Allowing unauthorized persons access to buildings without security clearance. We are getting tighter on this one, y'all. If you haven't noticed, we're getting really tight on this. Using, duplicating, or possessing keys to buildings or offices within the building without authorization. <coughs> damaging or attempting to damage property of BOA, an employee, or the public. Using, possessing, or threatening to use an unauthorized weapon during a time covered by this policy. Ow, man. All right. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go into the definition of workplace violence and drill down into it. Because when we think of workplace violence, the first thing that we normally think of are these major shootings, right? The things that make the news. But workplace violence is um, quite a vast um, range here. So the first fill in the blanks for the definition is workplace violence. These are all from um, the State uh, Human Resources Office. Workplace violence includes, but is not limited to, intimidation, bullying, stalking, threats, <coughs> physical attacks, domestic violence, property damage. It includes acts of violence committed by state employees, clients, customers, relatives, acquaintances, strangers against state employees in the workplace. So that is a mouthful, right? So we're looking at the very subtle to the very violent. But it all comes under the same workplace violence policy. So let's break this down. Let's start with intimidation. So again, this is um, OSHR definition. Intimidation is engaging in actions that include but are not limited to behavior intended to frighten, coerce, or induce duress. Intimidation. Bullying is the next one. We hear a lot about this lately. So bullying is unwanted offensive and malicious behavior. It undermines an individual or group through persistently negative attacks. There's an element of vindictiveness and the behavior is calculated to undermine, patronize, humiliate, intimidate, or demean the recipient. So we've heard in recent years about schoolyard bullying, cyberbullying, some suicides that have come from that, right? And so in my mind, they're like schoolyard bullies who never grew up. That's kind of how I see it. They're still in their minds at the schoolyard. Also, um, OSHA, um, OSHA did some studies a while back about bullying. And they're getting involved in that level of it because they're seeing that there is an escalation happening from bullying to these workplace violence acts. And what they found in this particular study was fascinating to me. They found that the level of an employee's bullying behavior, the higher it was, it directly correlated with that employee's level of workplace incompetence. So the more they bullied, the more incompetent they were. The less they bullied, the more competent they were. It rose and fell together like clockwork. Interesting, huh? So to me, it kind of tells me that the people who bully the most are kind of using it kind of as a smoke screen, right? To keep you from seeing that they don't know what they're doing at work. That's what I've noticed the most. And the bullies that I have met and worked with the most are truly incompetent. But instead of reaching out for help and trying to learn what they don't know, they start bullying to take your attention off of, right, there, that lack of knowledge. Um, let's see, stalking, harassing, or pestering an individual in person, in writing, telephone, or electronic format. It involves following individuals, spying on them, alarming the recipient, or causing them distress. It involves violence or the fear of violence. When I first moved here to North Carolina in 2003, I worked um, with a company at RTP where um, I was an EAP consultant, employee assistance program. And I was involved in a high profile stalking case. One of my client companies was Verizon Communications. And what happened, this was, uh, this was their office up in New York City. And so this was um, 
uh, these were two co-workers, female and a male. And he was union, she was not. And he had asked her out, asked her out, asked her out, she, she turned him down. Then he starts sending her sexually explicit emails. She goes to her supervisor, asks for this to stop. Supervisor tells him to stop, tells him to stop. He doesn't stop. He continues on and on. And finally, one evening, he follows her home. So in New York City, they live in uh, row homes, like townhouses, row homes. And parking is on the street. So she pulled up on the street, got out of her car, went up the steps into her uh, row home. He pulls in behind her on the other side of the street. And what he didn't know is that she had a boyfriend who just literally followed her, parked behind her, and literally was following her by about a minute or two. But when her boyfriend got on her steps, this guy gets out of his car and goes and beats the living crap out of him. So there was no question that this was assault and battery. He was charged, found guilty, and actually did jail time for it um, because that guy actually ended up in the hospital. It was pretty bad. Um, the question at work was, was this workplace violence? And the union who represented him said, no, it's not workplace violence. These two men are not co-workers, and this did not happen on workplace property. Management came back and said, but for the fact that you were stalking this woman, this would have never happened, right? So management actually ended up winning on that one. Now, he didn't lose his job. Um, right, I, I was kind of taken back on that one. What they did was they reassigned him to another Verizon office about 30 miles away. It wasn't a promotion, but, but I, I would assume in time. Um, but what happened was he was reassigned, and then he filed a grievance with the union and said, this is a hardship on me and my family because it's 30 miles out of my way. It's all this extra money in gas. And, um, and you know he won. And so he ended up getting put right back into the call center where she worked, again sitting catty cornered from her like he had originally. She calls me, and this is what she says, you will never hear from me again. She says, I'm not putting in two weeks notice. I'm leaving and nobody will ever see me again because my life is worth more than this. And I thought, wow. And she was right. I never heard from her again. And they continued on as if nothing had happened. And, you know, that's to say it doesn't always end up the way that you want it to. It really is a scary situation. And so, we, you know, we don't think about stalking, but when it came to that situation, then the rest of the, the workforce were just terrified, right? That here he was again. And especially the women. You can imagine. Um, a threat is the expression of intent to cause physical or mental harm. An expression constitutes a threat without regard to whether the party communicating the threat has the ability to carry it out or not. So let's say, James, I come to you and I say I'm going to shoot you, and, but it doesn't matter whether I have a gun or I don't have a gun or whether I have the ability to even use one or not, right? It's still a threat. If I threaten to kill you, it's a terroristic threat by law, right? Um, physical attack. This is assault, legally. Unwanted or possible physical contact. Hitting, hitting, fighting, pushing, shoving, throwing objects at people is an assault. <coughs> property damage is intentional. Intentional damage done to property includes property owned by the state, employees, visitors, or vendors. Domestic violence, you're thinking, why on earth is this in here? We'll talk about this. The use of abusive or violent behavior includes threats and intimidation between people who have an ongoing prior intimate relationship, married, not married, partners, living together, not living together, whatever. So one in four incidents of workplace violence committed in the U.S. today are connected with domestic violence. <coughs> One in four. Um, another company I worked with was Progress Energy here in town before it became Duke, Progress, Progress Duke, whatever it is now, right? 
Progress Energy Building. I don't know if you all remember, but in the early 90s, when I first came here, um, or early 2000, it was around, I came in 03, so it was around that time that I saw on the news where two different women had been killed by a partner at Progress Energy. One was put in the trunk of a car and driven off-site, and one was taken off-site and killed. So, um, a third incident was brewing, and that's when they called me into the situation. So I went up, and this is what happened. One of their female co-workers in one of the higher floors of Progress Energy um, had a restraining order against her husband. And the restraining order said that he couldn't come within 100 feet of her. So one morning, she was at work, sitting, doing her thing, right? Emails, whatever it is that we do. And um, her husband came up. But he didn't come into the workplace. He didn't violate that restraining order. He sits in the lobby. And they have those key things to where, you know, you hit your key thing and, and security. He doesn't even go in. He sits in the lobby. And as her coworkers come off the elevator, he says, hey, tell Mary your husband's here. Right? They don't know any better. So they say, okay, all right, we'll tell her. So they go and they say, hey, Mary, your husband's here. And she doesn't say anything. She says, okay. Maybe. And so they kind of move on, right? The next next person that comes off the elevator say, tell Mary her husband's here and I'm getting tired of waiting for her. So they say the same thing. You know, they go, they tell her and she says, okay, all right. So this goes on for 30 minutes. And um, finally one of her friends notices that she never gets out of her chair. So he comes over to her and he says, listen, your husband's been out there for about 30 minutes. What's going on? She bursts into tears, right? She runs into her supervisor's office, explains about the restraining order, and then the next thing you know, they're calling me, and so we're talking about safety, security, domestic violence. One thing that we actually did in that situation was that we, um, we got a corporate restraining order, which you can do. And so as the Progress Energy building, we had a security, uh, we had a protective order against him because he was loitering, really, because he wasn't restraining, he wasn't violating that restraining order. He was very smart, knew what he was doing. Um, and so, and they just uh, called it loitering. So other than domestic violence, what was he doing to her? Right. Harassing, stalking. Intimidating. stalking, intimidating, intimidating big time. And it worked, it worked, it would have worked with anybody. So it's, it's interesting, and so that whole place kind of, the buzz started going around of what was happening, right? Uh, let's talk about domestic violence at the workplace. Homicide, these are OSHA statistics. Homicide is the number one leading cause of death to women in the workplace. And the overwhelming majority is connected with domestic violence. 21% of all full-time employed adult workers reported being a victim of domestic violence. I think the operable word there is reported, right? Because um, women are more likely to report than men. I have worked with both men and women perpetrators and men and women victims. Men, women are more likely to report, but many don't. Many don't report at all. 24% of all incidents of violence in the workplace that occur in the U.S. every year are connected with domestic violence. So one in four. So think about the apex, the target situation, the progress energy, those two brother-in-laws, right? There was another one right there in Cameron Village uh, a few years ago. I got an email, I was working at the Department of Agriculture, and it said, nobody go to Cameron Village. There's been a shooting. You all remember that? Remember that? So what happened was is that a woman had been divorced. She had uh, left North Carolina, gone either to South Carolina or Georgia, and I can't. And she recently moved back, got a job at one of the little boutique stores at Cameron Village, and um, he found her. He had never let this go. He found her, came and waited, and on the sidewalk at 10 o'clock in the morning, he shoots her dead right there on the sidewalk. He tore off running into the hills. It took him hours to find her. And of course, all Cameron Village has the crime scene tapes. What up? 
All right, this is the American Institute on Domestic Violence. These were employees that identified themselves as victims of workplace violence. 96% of them said they experienced problems at work due to abuse. 96. When I first saw that, I thought, man, that's like, that is a high number, right? Um, but then when I kind of delved deeper into it, it made a little bit more sense. 74% said they are harassed while at work by their abusers. How are people harassed at work by their abusers? <coughs> Phone calls. Emails, texting, what other ways? <coughs> they feel like they're being treated unfairly? Okay, so just thinking about domestic violence, so, but how, how would they be harassed at work by their abuser? Well, think about the progress energy. Right, just showing up at work, right? When, when men are harassing women at work, they tend to call the women. When women are harassing men at work, do you know who they usually call? Supervisors, right? Get them in trouble, get them fired. So it's just, it's kind of a different dynamic there that happens. Um, so we, we talked about a few of them, right? The stalking, the inappropriate things that can happen. Uh, 56% are late to work because of domestic violence. Why would that be? Covering bruises. Covering bruises. Getting themselves, yeah. Mornings are hard for these folks. Mornings are very difficult. A lot of the incidents happen in the morning, oddly. Um, covering bruises up. These women are masters at using actor's makeup rather than department store makeup because it's thicker and it covers more. Um, any other thoughts about that, of why they'd be late? Yeah. The perpetrator purposely delays them. Right. That, that happens a lot because, again, that will impact their work and cause them serious trouble. They purposefully delay them getting to work because it impacts their ability to or money, make a living. What did you say? I said it's called power and control. We're power. talking about controlling the finances and what that means that you don't go to work, you know, you got to be late taking the children, you know, there's any incidents. All the big, all the business accounts they for I was going to say, how many of you all are from the Council of Women? Where's the Council of Women folks? All right, so these are all the, the, the experts in domestic violence. But I, I've got a link to them kind of personally, only because I used to do that work. Worked with perpetrators, so I'm always, I always have a little bit of a heart with them, so. Anyway, that's exactly right. There's a power and control that goes with domestic violence. 28% of people leave work early because of domestic violence. Why would they leave work early? They're still at work. They're still at work. The other person still at work. Oh, the other person is still at work, so they want to get home before them. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. It's much easier for the perpetrators. You know, are you dating on the job? Do you need to be home by? You can't leave the house. It's just so many things that contribute to get to the city and work early. Right. You know, the best have a child picked up when I tell you to pick the child up. You know, don't speak to any of your coworkers. You know, get out the door. Like I said, there's many things you can come and talk about when it comes to parenting. Right, exactly. Exactly. I'm in the back. Yeah, I was just going to say maybe the person is threatening to them if they don't come home now, they're going to do something. Yeah. Threats are just a threats are an everyday part of that. That's why yeah. I believe early. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have a question for you. I think that, you know, the more aware people become of this one in four statistic, we become aware of how prevalent domestic violence is across all of the genres. And you've got a whole fleet of people in this room that will testify the only thing victims have in common is they're victims. Right. So when it comes to, suppose I'm in a domestic violence relationship, I'm fearful. I do similar to what the woman at Duke Energy did. I go and I obtain a restraining order. 
I think where we have been very slow is what do we do then? What is our responsibility to employers? And I know when a lot of these started coming up, it was more victim blaming. She should have notified the employer. She put victims at risk. So my question to you, Betty, is what is DOA's policy? What kind of security, given the statistics you just mentioned, the number of people in this room, if we were in a domestic violence situation, how does DOA protect us and what is their policy on that? Couple things, that's a great question. So number one, one thing that I do out of this piece of this training is to encourage victims of domestic violence, if you have a restraining order against somebody, let somebody know. A supervisor or a supervisor that you trust, right? Hopefully they're the same person. Um, and let safety folks know. So in our case, it's Robin Barfield, who's our safety director, because we need to put measures in place to be vigilant and watching this. Now, when I talk about letting us know about the restraining order, I am not big in people sharing all this stuff. I'm really not. I want to keep that stream of information as narrow as possible, but alert the people who absolutely need to know. And then second of all, what we're trying to do is really come down on security as far as buildings, as far as entrances and exits. We are, um, and Robin is a big piece of this right now. He's really working with making sure that piggybacking doesn't happen. The, the only people with badges can get into buildings. And you've got to have, um, you've got to have signage, you've got to have, you know, extra security measures for anybody that's not an employee that enters the building. So right now, that's kind of, those are the two main things that we're looking at. Um, I'm sure the, the awareness in this is a big piece of it. I think the way that we can destigmatize the issue, because they're so common, it's more common than what people know. And is the employee protected from retaliation by the employer because she has brought that to their attention? Uh, legally, um, I have to think about that. I have to think about it. The only, I know exactly what you're talking about because what's happened in the past is that uh, a partner will call, 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 call. And then the employer will say, listen, you take care of this. It's disrupting the workplace. Um, and, you know, we can't have this, it's disrupting too many things. And that's exactly what the perpetrator's wanting to do, right? To get him to lose their job, get him in trouble. And so I'm hoping by awareness of this that we can do a better job at kind of protecting and not making the victim a victim again, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't have the specific answer to that for you. Yeah, I know one of the things that we did you know, as region directors, because we work with so many agencies that actually have to develop workplace balance plans. And we actually do let them know about, you know, uh, how to share a protective order, but also let the agency know about how to go out and also have a protective order against the perpetrator. And one of the things that Kathleen has whispered in the ear <laughs> is uh, we also teach about safety planning when we're working with the administrators at nonprofit agencies. We don't do this at DOA because, I mean, you know, that's what you do. But um, there is some laws in the books in reference to what happens when agencies began to feel as if they need to fire a person. There are some protection laws. So those are some of the things that we talk about. And the Department of Labor actually does have all their different things about workplace balance online. Should anybody want to go to the website and read uh, what the state of North Carolina and the Department of Labor is talking about? I don't know one of the numbers that you and Diane talked about. You talked about the one employee number because you used the word domestic violence. But we tend to go with, we're, we're stepping that up and we're going with the word intimate partner balance. So we're going with the one and three number so that people can understand how great and how fast domestic balance is in the workplace. So we're talking about just looking in this room, every third person in this room has experienced some form of domestic violence, you know, just talking on a generic level. So people can understand exactly what, that, what happens. Right? And the prevalence of it. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that we're all, we're all affected, even if we're not personally, we know somebody who is. We're working right around somebody who's affected by it. Exactly. Who needs our support in the, in the biggest way.
It's a routine evening for Lieutenant Brian Garrett, only 90 minutes into his shift with the Polk County, Florida Sheriff's Department, and three domestic violence calls have already come in. How many domestic violence calls do you get on most nights? It might not be unusual to have six or eight. Is this the first time this has happened? 22-year-old Shannon Way is eight months pregnant with her boyfriend's baby. He got pissed off at me and uh, said I was attacking him, and then he started hitting me. It's estimated 1.3 million women of all classes, all ethnic groups in the U.S., are assaulted by a partner every year. One in every four women will be on the receiving end of domestic violence at some point in their life. Teenagers aren't immune. One in five high school girls have been physically or sexually abused by a date. 
The latest poster child for domestic violence is superstar R&B singer Rihanna. Last week, her boyfriend, hip-hop singer Chris Brown, was charged with two felonies after allegedly punching, choking, and biting her. But reports say the couple has since reconciled. A lot of officers said they would, they would rather go to a robbery in progress than a domestic violence situation. Because? And because you just never know what's going on. He had kicked me in my head. This 911 call was made after Barbara Hurt's boyfriend beat her after he came home from a court-ordered anger management class. This is his fire pit. 37 years old, Hurt says her boyfriend, Anthony Civitarese, would beat her, beg for forgiveness, she'd take him back, and the cycle of abuse would start over. He said he would kill me, cut me up with the chainsaw in little bitty pieces, and put me in that fire pit. Court records show the violence only escalated. He's cracked my ribs or broken some ribs. He's busted my eye, I can't count how many times. My nose has been broken and busted and bitten. Now in jail for domestic battery, Siva Therese will be out next month. What happens when he gets out of jail? Um, I have to change my um, identity, my name, my location where I, I stay, my hair, my looks. I have to just get away from him. This time, Barbara Hurt says it's over. You're going to press charges? I don't know. As for Shannon Way. Right now, at this point, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> But victim advocates insist there is something people can do. Don't blame yourself and ask for help because domestic violence is a crime. Byron Pitts, CBS News, Lakeland, Florida.